Good morning to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to open the session, uh, long journey of work today. Um, the topic of the session today is how to interpret the CISG. We have here Professor Franco Ferrari, who is the star of the meeting, I guess. <laughs> And then two commentators that are professors are at FGV, Professor Mauricio Prado, who is a professor at the Business School of FGV, and a lawyer at Elio Batista Advogados, and Professor Javier Alinace, who is a professor here at Direito GV, and a lawyer at uh, Nasser Advogados. Professor Habi also had a chance to train a group of students here at FGV uh, for the William Vs competition that deals with the CISG um, uh, regulation and uh, practice. So he's the, the person in charge of breaking this culture and this knowledge for the school. We thank him for this. Uh, well, for, uh, we have about uh, an hour for the exposition and then the commentators. I'll be strict to the time. I, I'm sure that I will not be necessary for that, but then we have an hour for discussion. Uh, for the audience to help but in your comments and ta and questions and re any remarks you may have. So, uh, Professor Franco Ferrari, uh, give you the floor. You have the floor for your presentation and comments. Thank you very much, Michelle, for um, opening this session. So, again, I will, as promised, speak for 20 minutes, exactly 20 minutes. No, it's okay. So, I will speak for 20 minutes on actually interpretation. Um, I want to talk about first some of the most obvious issues, meaning how to interpret CSG, and some of the less obvious issues, meaning how it is really interpreted, at least in some countries. And when I say how it is really interpreted, of course, I mean how it is really wrongly interpreted. So we all know, but this is not only true for the CSG that uniform law conventions, whether these are substantive law conventions or conflicts of law conventions, have to be interpreted in a way, in order actually to allow the goal that the drafters wanted to reach, to be reached. What do I mean? I mean that irrespective of Article 7 of the CSG, which I will be talking about, the rules on interpretation of uniform law instruments are anyway so set out in Article 7, meaning that irrespective of the existence, you would have to basically resort to the same interpretive rules, even absent in Article 7. It is obvious. It is obvious because uniform texts do not lead to uniform law necessarily, or actually uniform text by itself do not amount to uniform law. That is obvious. We have various examples from the last century when Japan basically introduced the German Civil Code, when the Turks did introduce the revision, the revised actual code of obligations in their country, and for example, when Article 9 of the UCC was adopted in Canada. These are uniform texts, but not examples of uniform law. The reason being that the most important criterion for one to be able to talk about uniform law is missing. Meaning, the intention actually to have that uniform text to be applied in one and the same manner in more than one jurisdiction. Unless you have this intention to do so, uniform law can only be a chance event. In fact, Japanese people could not care less how the German civil code is interpreted, or the Turks, how the Swiss is interpreted, or the Canadians, how Article 9 of the UCC is interpreted. Even so, they have bi-yearly meetings to see where they are going. It's not uniform law. So you need actually this animus unificandi in order to actually have uniform law at all. But obviously, that in itself is not sufficient either, meaning that the text created with that intention is the starting point of any unification effort. The unification efforts that encompass a uniform interpretation. Article 7 is an obvious rule. Hundreds, literally hundreds of papers have been written about Article 7. Article 7 imposes a mandate, actually, upon the courts, on the one hand to 
take into consideration the international character of the instrument, CSG in our case, and also to promote the uniform or the need for a uniform application of that text. Reference is also made to good faith, and uh, some of you know I believe certain things about good faith. It's not an issue here, in my opinion. So let me focus on the first two elements. What does it mean to interpret a instrument in light of its international character? It means that what you should normally, and you will see why I say normally, avoid is resort to domestic rules in order to interpret that instrument. Let me give you a very easy and simple example. The CSG, unlike more recent conventions, does not contain definitions. The most recent conventions, UNCITRAL, UNIDRA, have all a list of definitions. CSG does not. We don't even know what goods are. Let me make an example. Let's suppose that you are a party that has its place of business in Austria. You are Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you are selling your elephant to somebody in Germany. Why do I say that? Because both in Austria and in Germany, there's a domestic rule that says animals are no goods. So if an Austrian or a German judge were to interpret the CSG not in light of the criterion I mentioned, then the CSG would not be applicable. That can't be. So the idea is that, according to some colleagues, all, in my opinion, that is not true, most concepts of the CSG have to be interpreted autonomously meaning in a way that does not necessarily, you will see later why I say that, mirror domestic law, whether it's domestic law of the forum or any other law, that is really important. I also said, more often than not, there is a reason. There are some concepts to which this idea of autonomous interpretation does actually not apply. I can tell you two of these concepts. One is obvious, it is to be found in Article 1 and Article 7, the concept of private international law. There's no way the courts have to come up with an autonomous interpretation of the concept of private international law and what it means, because otherwise it would mean to create a conflict of law um, convention or read a conflict of law um, rule into it, even so the CSG is not a conflict of law convention. So private international law, and I think today everybody agrees with that, wasn't always like that, is not a concept to be interpreted autonomously. The other one is even easier and even more important. The concept of party. Who's party to a contract? You would say, what does it mean? The CSG. No, the CSG does not define party to a contract. The CSG, and this was mentioned yesterday by our colleague, has a limited scope of application. It does not deal with, it doesn't, it's not me, huh? <laughs> I'm not Pilar. <laughs> um, the CSG actually um, has a limited scope. It does, for example, not deal with agency law. Why is it important? Since it does not deal with agency, let's suppose there is a case where the seller contacts an intermediary, let's be very neutral, to sell certain goods in a market the intermediary is very knowledgeable of. Okay, the intermediary goes into that market, concludes a contract, and first case, does not disclose the principle. Second case, does disclose the principle. Who's party to the contract? We know that the buyer is party to the contract, but who's really the seller? The CSG does not deal with it. So you see, looking or trying to interpret the concept of party in an autonomous way is not correct, given that agency is not covered. So what I said earlier about autonomous interpretation is really nice, applies to all uniform law conventions or instruments, but it has limitations. That's something, in my opinion, that is incredibly important. We have case law on that that points out what these limitations are. Next step. Oh, great, so we all can come up with these autonomous interpretations and so forth. Does that create uniformity? No. Consider the possibility of one concept leading you to more than one autonomous interpretation. I give you the easiest example. That is that of place of business. What's a place of business? According to some, every place from which you do business. Okay. According to others, according to others, uh, I was saying, a place from where you do business and there is some st stability. Okay? According to other people yet, stability is required, duration 
that may amount to stability and autonomous power to contract. So you see, at this point, and we could go on, I have pointed out three autonomous interpretations. But by itself, you can see that it doesn't help, because the next judge has a choice. And the chance that the judge applies one of those three is 33%. Do you see that? So you need something other than just autonomous interpretation to get to uniform law. And that's where the second part of Article 7.1 comes in. That's the part that says that you also have to take into consideration the need to promote a uniform application. According to everybody today, that means courts of one country have to actually look into what happens in other countries. So basically, you have to look into foreign case law and see whether there is actually uh, a solution on a similar problem. Now, it is completely wrong to suggest, as one author says, I don't mention his name, oh yes, I do, Larry Di Matteo, Actually, he suggests to create a supranational stare decisis. He knows it. He's a friend, so he knows that I'm trashing him all the time. It's not something I'm doing secretly. He knows it. How can you suggest a supranational stare decisis? It doesn't work, because the idea of stare decisis is embedded in a very precise hierarchical structure of courts, which in a transnational setting which he suggests does not exist. Allow me to give you an example. Where does an Italian Supreme Court decision stand vis-a-vis -a, -vis a German court decision of the first instance? I prefer a German court of first instance always over any Italian Supreme Court decision. <laughs> Believe me, in doubt you go to look at Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, no doubt. But you see, so this is missing. And also, in this area we are talking about, and it was mentioned yesterday by Eduardo, there are arbitral awards. So in a hierarchy of courts, where do you actually put in this idea of arbitral awards also dealing with CSG? In my opinion, actually, most of these arbitral awards are of a higher standing than some of the lower courts. Why? Because we know the arbitrators are chosen, the arbitrators normally are chosen because they know about CSG, all the things we know. So forget this idea of creating a stare decisis. In fact, that's not what Article 7.1 imposes. Article 7.1 imposes the need to look or to actually take into consideration the need to, for uniform application. That's it. So it is sufficient, in my opinion, that the court actually looks at it, can take over the decision, no doubt, if it is convinced. Do you see that? But that's the only criteria. Are you convinced as a judge? Yes. Are you not? Then, you know, you disregard it. But you have to take it into consideration. There are several cases that have done so. We know, of course, the very first one was an Italian one by Vigevano. That court decision specifically referred to this issue of no need or no possibility for a stare decisis. Expressly said, foreign court decisions are persuasive only. A lot of other courts from Germany, France, and um, even Greece has stated so as well. So today, everybody but Mr. Larry Di Matteo disagrees with that. Now, that is one thing. So you have actually um, to consider what uh, methodological problems come up in interpretation. That's the only one, in my opinion. The next one is a practical problem. How do you get to these foreign courts? So it's really nice to say you know, we should look into those. Now today we know, um, of course, um, we have several websites. One is run actually by Professor Perales. We have other ones. So there is enough free information out there that today you cannot say what US courts say. US courts say consistently, oh, there's no case on uh, this issue in the US. Who cares? You do not have to look at US cases to comply with Article 7. In order to comply with Article 7, you have to look at foreign cases. So there's no excuse not to look at foreign cases, even by US courts, because a lot of these court decisions, more than a 1,000, have been translated into English. Also, there is case law that shows that even US courts rarely refer to foreign court decisions. 
So most recent court decision um, uh, that deal with this issue specifically are two from Italy, Tribunale di Forli, one of the 6th of March 2012, the other one from the 12th of November, exactly two weeks ago of uh, 2012. In one case, 45 foreign court decisions have been cited and another 20 arbitral awards, so about 65 foreign decisions, as well as in the most recent ones, and 45. But not only, and that's a nice part, not only those decisions the court agrees with. You will find reference in those court decisions to case law that where it says contra si. So the court has actually looked at those, was in my opinion not convinced by those decisions which go the other way, and has used a different set. That's exactly what should happen. Still, the court could even take a third opinion. That's not the problem. The methodology, in my opinion, is what really is a problem. Methodologically, not a lot of courts use them. So I have done several surveys on whether courts are using foreign court decisions. There are more and more courts that refer to them. We have some from Spain, some from Belgium, a lot from Germany, but the Italian courts of first instance are the ones that do refer most to them. Um, so that's one thing. So this is basically very short what Article 7 says, and uh, Professor Perales has written a lot on that as well. So there's a lot to be said. I want to talk about something else in the last eight minutes I have. I want to talk about what, Itali what um, US courts do and how bad they are. From the beginning, the most famous case is Telki Carrier, from the 90s, early 90s, courts have stated there's no U.S. case law on CSG, so that is bad anyway, because you should have looked at other things. That's one thing. But this sentence is repeated even in 2012. But the next part is bad, because what U.S. courts actually tend to do, in my opinion, not only in specific areas, but unfortunately, as I will show generally, is to say, where the wording of the Uniform Commercial Code tracks that of the CSG, you can resort to UCC case law. This goes against everything Article 7 and any unification effort stands for because it violates the very first rule I mentioned, meaning that uh, person to which you have to actually um, disregard, at least initially, domestic law. I'm not saying a judge should not somehow find inspiration by domestic case law on how to approach a given issue. That's not what I'm saying. I want to be clear about that. Obviously, you will you do that as a judge, no doubt. But you cannot equate a priori the wording of the CSG with that of the UCC or any of your domestic laws. That's where the problem lies. Unfortunately, again, even in 2012, this has been said a lot. I call this actually the homeward trend. I wrote several papers on what is called the homeward trend, and uh, I wouldn't know how to um, translate it into Portuguese. Um, one of my students did translate it, and I like that. Abordagem domestica, approche insularist in French. But homeward trend is exactly what it is. You try to read into an international instrument what you, as a forum, know. So you, do you see that? So I, what's the concept of place of business? Under tax laws in the United States, as soon as you biz, do business even one day in the US, you will be taxed. So somebody may have in mind his or her concept of place of business. Wrong. So it's wrong, so not only in respect of what US courts do generally, but I want to um, refer to one specific issue, that of foreseeability of damages again. U.S. courts consistently, unfortunately, interpret Article 74 that has a rule on how damages are limited to foreseeable ones, the ones foreseeable at the time of conclusion of the contract by the party in breach. They interpret the ad rule, I was saying, like the U.S. or English, actually, contemplation rule or Hadley versus Baxendale. Some of that is wrong to see that. It could only be okay if the drafters of the CSG had actually intentionally taken over a concept from 
English or US laws, then it would be okay. But that's not the case. First of all, because the Hadley versus Baxendale rule is not an English rule. This is not what Americans understand. Very famous papers say, for example, the Hadley versus Baxendale rule is a judicial invention in an era of industrial revolution. Paper by Danzig, incredibly famous. Completely wrong. All of us have done Roman law. They don't even know what that is. We know. In Roman law, you had a rule that limited damages to foreseeable ones. What when the thief was actually caught with the goods in hand? three times more the value of the goods. Four manifestum, all this, uh, we know all of that. Then you get to Middle Ages, canon law, and then you get to Potier and Thomas. In fact, none of the Americans has ever read Hadley versus Baxendale. I say that because in Hadley versus Baxendale, the reference is expressly made to the old rulings of French law and Potier is cited. Cases. From 1952, same year as Hattie versus Bex, and they also refer to the fact that this is a French rule taken over. Has nothing to do with an industrial revolution or judicial invention. Do you see the difference? It's from French law, if at all. In my opinion, the drafters didn't even want to take French law over. In my opinion, the drafters wanted to find a rule on limitation of damages. The substance of the rule is completely different, apart from the origin. And the US law and English law, you have to look into what was contemplated by the parties. So there's contemplation requirement and the parties. Wow, that restricts damages even more. Because if you contemplate something, it's not just foreseeable. You have to put more attention to it, more awareness to it, both parties. So th there are differences. So this is what I called um, the homeward trend. There's something even worse. And uh, then I'm getting close to closing, actually. So something even worse, not only in US courts that deals with interpretation. This is what I call Lex Forism. Lex Forism is different from Homeward Trend. Let me repeat what Homeward Trend is. The attempt to read into an international instrument your domestic law. For obvious reason, you are trained in that law. It makes sense. We associate, each one of us, with the concept, for example, of sale our domestic concept, and then we try to get rid of this domestic understanding because Article 7 tells us. That's one thing. Bad enough, um, actually, to suggest the homeward trend is a good thing. There's a colleague, Halverson Cross, if you know her, you avoid her, because she writes why homeward trend is something the CSG is promoting. I do not have words for that, and I don't want to be sued. I wrote that she's really bad, but that's enough. I don't say anything else. Lexforism is a step further and it's even worse. Lexforism, as the words indicate, is the attempt by the courts to get to the Lex Fori. You see that it's not just an interpretation of an instrument, which still is what you're doing, interpreting the instrument in light of domestic law. Lexforism is the attempt to get to your domestic law right away, so not even to the convention. The CSG has obviously only one provision that allows it. We mentioned yesterday, Article 6. How do you get to a Lex Forism in Article 6? That's exactly what the US courts consistently do. US courts state, you cannot get out of the CSG unless you do so expressly. Nothing of the implicit things we mentioned yesterday and we'll probably talk about today. OK, that helps the party who wants the CSG in. So you can't get out unless you say express. One exception, if the parties refer to UCC, Oh, by chance, UCC is a Lex Fori in the US. So did you see that? So that doesn't make sense. If you were to say in your contract, purely domestic German law, for the US courts, not enough, which means the same as UCC in the US. So you see why I say this is Lex Forism. So that's one example. But as far as Lex Forism is concerned, there are other examples, and then I'm really going to conclude. France. The French Supreme Court consistently says that if the parties plead on the sole basis of French domestic law, CSG is out implicitly. Other courts more correctly say no, only if you are aware of what you're doing. But this is not the French court. French court says you are out, which means Lex Fori again. I finish with an incredible example. I say incredible because you would not ever think that there can be a Lex Forism example in arbitration. Because arbitration doesn't have a forum. I mean, we know that. Of course, Italians do it badly. 
that thing they do bad. And um, there was an arbitral tribunal composed of three Italian law professors trained only in Italian law. Language was Italian. The choice of law in the contract was choice of Italian law, and the seat was in Florence, Italy. These people were able to say that this choice of law led to Italian domestic law, because that's the only thing they knew. We all know, and it will come up, that the choice of the law of a contracting state is not an exclusion of the um, CSG. We all know and we all agree with that. So you see why I say even in an arbitration, because everything was linked to Italy, they sought to have to apply Italian law wrongly. So these are basically uh, the few things I wanted to say. There are a lot of papers authored by various colleagues here as well, as I mentioned. <coughs> Article 7 is a starting point. Do not stop there. Go beyond. Try to avoid your homeward trend. Try to avoid what is even worse, the Lex Forism. And I'm sure you will do much better than US courts. Thank you very much. <laughs>eu acho que o ponto de convergência importante que o professor Ferrari sublinha, que eu gostaria de sublinhar é que, de fato, nós não estamos falando, quando se promove a uniformidade de interpretação da convenção, não é uma solução única. Isso é um ponto bastante importante. É uma metodologia. É uma metodologia e essa metodologia pode implicar em resultados diferentes. As cortes consideram as decisões que foram proferidas em outras cortes, de outras nações, e, tomando em consideração isso, pode chegar em posições completamente diferentes. Então, a metodologia promove, mas não garante, não tem uma, uma, uma segurança de uma aplicação única. E, com isso, a, nós conseguimos conviver ou viver de um contexto de diversidade. E é isso que eu gostaria de sublinhar. Que nós não podemos imaginar que uma convenção vai ter algum dia uma interpretação uniforme em bases mundiais. A Convenção de Viena, ainda que tenha essa vocação de governar a cumprimento internacional em bases universais, jamais terá, no universo potencial de 190 países, apreciando a Convenção de Viena, terá uma aplicação uniforme. Esse é um objetivo, uma, um objetivo, uma utopia, que não é só da Convenção de Viena, é de toda e qualquer Convenção de Direito Internacional sobre normas de direito internacional privado ou de normas materiais. E, portanto, se, se isso é um dado de realidade com o qual nós temos que, que lidar, quais são os mecanismos que promovem uma convergência, uma consistência na direção de uma interpretação uniforme? É, sem dúvida, o fundamental que está no paper do professor Ferrari é o Foro de Educação de, de conversa, discussão, diálogo entre juízes, eh, diálogo entre formadores de opinião, e, por isso, até nós estamos conversando de fazer um evento junto com as Cortes uh, de Alta Instância Brasileira, STJ, STF, sobre a aplicação da Convenção de Viena, para que se possa aumentar a eficiência uh, desse mecanismo da aplicação convergente uh, e consistente dessa Convenção no Brasil. Uh, o fato é que isso não vai ser suficiente, é um dos caminhos. E, na minha perspectiva, o, o que é importante é a convenção, e aí eu acho que nós partimos de um ponto de divergência, é a convenção se apoiar em outros instrumentos internacionais que estão na mesma, no mesmo trend, na mesma orientação. Então, 
Um, um instituto internacional muito importante é a arbitragem, em que está baseado numa convenção de Nova Convenção de Nova York, que está ratificada por mais de 140 países, que também tem essa escala, portanto, universal, e que, de fato, nos leva a dizer que os árbitros, embora possam cometer erros, são mais pessoas mais qualificadas para dar a interpretação válida, ou seja, a enforceable interpretation da convenção. Então, uma das formas de se promover a interpretação uniforme da convenção é promover o uso da convenção junto com o Instituto da Arbitragem, saindo da esfera judicial. E o segundo instituto, que é importante hoje em dia não é no foro internacional e que ganha importância lentamente, são os princípios da Unidroá. A convenção, na minha perspectiva, ela ganha solidez ela ganha solidez na medida em que ela se conecta com um outro instrumento de direito material, de parte geral, também com uma vocação internacional, autônoma, certo? E mais moderna. Essa conexão permite para o futuro uma interpretação mais sólida, mais focada na uniformidade. É claro que há pontos a a pontos entre a Convenção e os princípios de Nidroá que não são convergentes. Nesse caso, a Convenção prevalece no que for especial, ou outros que são convergentes. Grande parte dos princípios de Nidroá é parte geral do direito, portanto, há aí uma convergência. Podemos discutir se a regra de Hart tipo, não é ou não é, não acho que não é bem o, o foco da discussão aqui, mas é o uso desse instrumento, que é soft law, é muito importante para que a gente possa avançar nessa definição, nessa, nessa solidez que precisa a Convenção para a interpretação. E aí eu acho que o professor discorda veementemente. You disagree. We, we agree no, to disagree. No. I don't disagree, no. because yesterday you told me that you no, are no, completely... No, it was an absurd, it was ridiculous. Yes, with Article 79, yes. <laughs> like, also, only Article 79. No, I wrote a paper calling it um, How to Create One Uniform Law. Why? I agree with what you said. One should Great. try to actually <laughs> interpret different instruments that had the same scope and the same interpretive rules in one and the same way. For example, what are goods under CSG should be goods under the Factoring Convention, under the Leasing Convention. Absolutely. So an inter-instrument interpretation is perfectly fine, mm -hmm. even UNIDRA. Mm -hmm. But UNIDRA comes into play, just to give you an example. For example, in saying what Article 74 says, what are damages, why? because UNIDRA may specify something that already exists. Mm. So I'm fine with interpreting the CSG, even in light of UNIDRA, as long as the starting point is CSG. Absolutely. So that's why I have to first determine whether hardship is covered. If I say no, as I believe, then I can't have resort to UNIDRA. If you say yes, then you can have resort to this. That's why I disagree mm. on Article 79, but not on the method. So, in fact, in Article 79, you say that there is no ambiguity in the Article 79, so there is no necessity to go to the UNIDRA principles in order to help the interpretation of the CSG. In my opinion, hardship as well as economic hardship is outside the scope of Article 79. So if that is true, mm. exactly, you cannot mm. introduce something new through a different instrument. That's the only thing mm. I'm saying. But for example, 74, you have 74 that tells you what damages are. Mm. I may actually be willing to read Article 74 in the light of the equivalent of UNIDRA because it's mm. a little more specific. It mm. gives us several rules. That mm. is fine with me. But the starting point has to be the CSG. I think this is a reference, sem dúvida, adequada, that the starting point should be the CSG. And that the principle of UNIDRA comes to complete what is necessary, not to ratify or modify the convention. Then we agree. Yes, we agree. But That's we disagree right. on 74, on 79. 79. We, 79 yes. we cannot, we can, we're not going to discuss no, 79. No, we're not talking about 79. We, we leave this as a surprise. Yes. That's something <laughs> people have to say tonight. <laughs> OK. Bom. Uh, então, eram esses meus comentários. <laughs> I hope we will discuss further this question. I was so confident that you would disagree with Nidra principle. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm disappointed. Thank you, Professor Manisio. Habi, you have the floor. 
Okay, so let me see if uh, some disagreement comes out okay. now. <laughs> Look, uh, well, I had, I had, uh, I, I, I was asked to prepare uh, a presentation in, in English, so uh, I didn't know uh, it could have made my life easier if I, if I knew we could uh, speak in Portuguese. But uh, I didn't prepare a presentation, but I have some some comments, some points that I would like to raise. And they are, uh, uh, the inspiration for these points comes from the papers of Professor Ferrari on this topic, uh, the topic of interpretation, and, uh, the inter the, the, and more specifically, Article 7 of the CISG. Um, I would like also to address this issue uh, on the perspective uh, uh, of the incorporation of CISG in Brazilian, uh, the ratification by Brazil. It, uh, it, of course, I think it's, uh, it's a consensus that this will bring certain problems uh, in the application of this instrument by these new interpreters of the CISG that will be Brazilian courts and Brazilian arbitrators. And I think it's useful for us to try to reflect a little bit on what kinds of problems uh, may arise and basically what are the challenges to be faced in this uh, learning process that we will certainly face uh, once the, the convention comes into force, right? Um, uh, and, and I think two uh, concepts here are, are the most important ones. One is the uniform application, which is the language of Article 7 and, uh, and uh, Professor Ferrari addressed. The other one is the autonomous interpretation of the CISG. Right? So my uh, reflections are a little bit uh, around these two these two concepts. Right? I think first it's good to remind to remember that uh, uniformity uh, uh, is relevant in two moments uh, when we talk about the CISG and other uniform laws. Uh, the first moment is the moment of the creation of this uniform set of rules, right? Uh, so there is this effort to reach uh, an understanding of what this, this set of rules should be, right? This effort, of course, was already uh, uh, engaged. It was uh, well successful, and that's why we're adhering to this set of rules. But one important thing is... Uh, 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 different from other uh, new laws that are uh, enacted in a country, uh, in Brazil, for example, we are ratifying a set of rules that was already there. Right? It's not a result of the discussions that usually take place when you enact uh, uh, a domestic law. Right? So uh, this is one of the problems to be faced. Right? So these, uh, uh, this, this set of rules was not the result of the, pr the legislative process of the country that sometimes makes it more easier to know what the meaning of these rules uh, is and how they should be interpreted. Right? The second moment in which uniformity is important is in the application, and that's our subject here. Right? So after there is this consensus of what these basic rules should be, of what these rules should be, these uniform rules, there is the moment of interpreting them in specific cases, in disputes, in concrete disputes. Right? Um, and as Professor Ferrari mentioned, Article 7 sets uh, three guidelines for this interpretation process that we have to be aware of. Right? Uh, and there, are, and there are three elements. One of them is uh, uh, uniform application, an effort to uh, ensure uniform application. The other one is take into consideration the international character. And the third one is a good faith in international trade. Right? So you see right away that these are uh, 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 three uh, uh, elements that do not have a precise content, They're, right? There is, there is no uh, 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 precise guidance of how these concepts should be uh, uh, considered, 
right? So what Professor Ferrari uh, uh, suggests is certain uh, um, uh, methodologies or certain instruments that can be used to ensure the, the, um, uh, these, these goals. Now, uniform application of the law uh, pursuant to Article 7 is in line of one of the attributions of the UNCITRAL itself. Right? So when I talk about these two moments, this was envisaged in the resolution that created UNCITRAL uh, by when, when saying, look, UNCITRAL has to prepare and promote the adoption of new international conventions, and another attribution, promote ways and means of ensuring a uniform interpretation and application of such international conventions. Right? So this is... Uh, 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 this, is, this was already set in the creation of UNCITRAL, this objective, right? Uh, so Article 7.1 is consistent with this mandate, I would say, uh, that was set forth for, for UNCITRAL. Now, uh, what are the challenges that uh, we, we will face when trying to, to apply these guidelines, right? The challenges I see. Well, first, first, a preliminary challenge when it comes to interpretation was something that was addressed yesterday, which is to determine whether CISG is applicable or not to a specific dispute. Right? This is a challenge of interpretation that will certainly be faced in many cases here. And this, is, this has to do with Article 1. Right? But, provided this is determined that CISG is applicable, then we come to Article 7 and to these three principles that have to be taken into consideration, and that's, uh, uh, that's correct. Um, so we, have, we will have two kinds of interpreters of the CISG. We will have the Brazilian courts and Brazilian arbitrators, right? Uh, what are the difficulties that I think will be faced? First of them, uh, the difficulty that derives from the fact that many of the concepts in the CISG are imprecise or are not defined, right? So they are open to divergent interpretations, right? Uh, and here I give an example. The, the, the quantity of times that the standard of reasonableness is uh, referred to in the CISG, right? Uh, the word, the, the, the reasonable or the variations of reasonable are used 50 times in the CISG, right? So in each specific case, there has to be given meaning to what this, this means, right? To the extent uh, uh, of, this, of this concept and how it should be applied in each specific case. This is this is one important difficulty. The same applies to other concepts, such as good faith, right? Uh, it also depends on the specific facts of a case uh, uh, to determine whether there was or there was not a breach of the duty of, the, of good faith, right? Um, so there are, there are uncertainties, right, as to what is the exact concept of many uh, 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 the exact content of many concepts in the CISG. Uh, international character and good faith are examples of this uh, uh, uncertainty as to the content. That has to be filled in in each specific case, right? Um, however, Professor Ferrari uh, 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 puts emphasis on the third element, which is the uniformity in the application of the CISG, right? And uh, the suggestion is that the interpretation must be autonomous in relation to domestic laws. Uh, uh, and I think this is, this is obviously correct. Uh, but I think we, we, when talking about autonomous interpretation, uh, it seems to me that this will always remain as an ongoing effort, right? Uh, unaccomplished, uh, unaccomplished uh, uh, effort to reach uh, uh, this autonomous interpretation. So, as Mauricio mentioned, we we can uh, we can adopt certain methodologies, right? But I think we have to be aware. Uh, at least I don't see what is the exact content of the autonomous interpretation. 
we can say what it is not, right? It is not applying domestic laws. It's not applying uh, 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 domestic interpretation of certain concepts, right? Uh, but we will never know what is exactly this autonomous interpretation, and it is not something that is precise. So it is rather an effort and not uh, uh, an, uh, a result that will be achieved sometime, right? Um, so we have to try to, to, to interpret it in a way that, that uh, does not uh, attach you to domestic interpretation or domestic concepts, uh, but I'm skeptic as to whether we will reach something that is uh, uh, widely recognized as the autonomous way to interpret the CISG, right? Uh, <coughs> <coughs> then the second, second uh, issue that seems important. So one of them is, well, we have some imprecise concepts that have to be uh, interpreted. Uh, the other thing is that interpretation can be simply defined as the exercise of applying rules to facts, right? To applying rules in specific cases, right? <laughs> uh, uh, so, because you will only you will only interpret a rule if you are facing a specific uh, dispute or a specific case. Otherwise, uh, as a professor, you write it. Yeah. You don't face it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but uh, here we're saying about the application, right? Uniform application. So uh, uh, uniformity in the application of the CISG, and this will only be uh, necessary when. So I think this this. Uh, gives us uh, an idea of the uh, difficulties faced in the uniform application. That's my point, right? Uh, so, of course, we can we can uh, say in theory what is in, uh, interpretation, but when we come to the uniform application, it will always depend on the specific facts of a case, right? Uh, and this is to illustrate a little bit my point that what are the difficulties to be faced, what are the challenges, right? Um, so as, as the facts are always different from one case to the other, right, uh, it is difficult, of course, to ensure uniformity in the application of the rules. This is an important uh, uh, limitation, I think. And, and I think this confirms that this will always be an incomplete endeavor, an incomplete effort. Right? Uh, so the application will necessarily vary in the application of the rules according to the specific circumstances of each dispute. Right? Uh, and to a certain extent, different interpretation of the same text or rules will be normal or natural. And maybe this is one. Uh, uh, Mauricio also mentioned the diversity, and uh, uh, so we have to be prepared for that, right? And this is normal, it's natural to a certain extent. And here I give uh, uh, a couple of, of examples. One of them is the interpretation of what is reasonable. This will necessarily vary from one case to the other. Another example, the amount of evidence that the interpreter will, uh, will need in order to decide that the goods do not conform to this, the requirements of, of the contract, for example, right? Under Article 35.2 of the CISG. So the amount of evidence needed to prove nonconformity. It could be an interpretation issue. Another one, the, the time frame for examination of the goods pursuant to Article 38.1 which sets that uh, examination should be done as soon as practicable, practicable or as soon as possible. Right? Um, so these are examples of, of rules of the CISG that will have to be interpreted according to the facts of each case. And this could lead to different views as to, as to what they really mean and how they should be applied, these standards. Right? Um, but at the same time, even if we have these difficulties, at the same time, it seems to me that the fact that there is a detailed set of rules concerning international sale and purchase of goods 
uh, and that in the, uh, uh, when compared to the Brazilian set of rules that we have in our civil code, it's a much more detailed and uh, adequate set of rules for international trade. This by itself, the fact that you have a detailed set of rules, probably will be uh, uh, um, will not leave much room for very exotic interpretations of the convention, right? Uh, or or uh, very uh, uh, um, divergent interpretations of the CISG. Uh, so maybe this is uh, something that will facilitate this effort of interpreting the CISG in Brazil. So maybe, maybe, uh, and then I, I go back to the concept of uniformity, maybe the best way to interpret uniformity when we think of, of the challenges that will be faced here uh, is that what we should do is ensure a certain consistency in the application of, of the CISG uh, so as to give predictability as to how these rules will be applied. Right? And try to ensure a certain harmonization or uh, a homogeneous interpretation of these concepts uh, uh, and knowing that we will never reach something as uniformity, right? This will always remain as a, as a, as an, as a goal. Um, so this seems to me the, 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 the challenge facing interpreters uh, uh, in Brazil. Of course, one way to deal with this challenge is awareness of foreign case law. And, and this, is, this is really uh, um, and, uh, uh, and undisputable, right? But this will not be uh, sufficient or an assurance of uniformity, as, as you, you, you said. Because there are problems in using foreign case law, and we were discussing this yesterday. There is the selections of the cases to be used, right? There is the interpretation of the decisions taken by, by in other jurisdictions, right? Uh, there is the questions of how representative these decisions are, right, in the interpretation of. Uh, and there are, finally, the differences in the facts. Uh, and I understand when you say uh, <clears throat> it's, I, I agree that it's always, it will always be useful and necessary to have recourse to foreign case law. But this should always be a cautious exercise, right? Um, uh, because these risks that I mentioned must be addressed, right? And they could lead, instead of leading to uniform application, they could lead to more confusion if badly applied, if this methodology is badly applied. Right? Um, so this is a valid guidance, but not the 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 only solution, right? Uh, another way, I think, is to always consider that one of the parties is not aware of Brazilian law and jurisprudence. So this I mean when, when we have Brazilian interpreters applying the CISG, uh, I think they have to, uh, 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 to be convinced, and this has to, be, to do with the international character of the convention, right? So always when interpreting this, uh, we should have in mind that one of the parties is not familiar with our uh, jurisprudence or our case law. And if we have this very strong, this, this reminder, right, maybe this is, this is a way to avoid uh, uh, incurring in the, in the errors that you, that you mentioned, right? Uh, <clears throat> So, in, in, and finally, to, to, I think it's, it's, uh, it's obvious that there will be an important role for the legal community in, uh, in addressing these challenges and these issues uh, in order to ensure um, that at least these uh, principles that are uh, provided for in Article 7 are uh, duly taken uh, into consideration in Brazil. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamdi. <coughs> Professor, would you like to react to any comment of yes, both of them? Actually, okay, great. Um, just to make sure um, what I wanted to say earlier, Mauricio. So where I stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis 
the use of other instruments. So I believe inter instrumental interpretation is something that is allowed. Some colleagues do not believe it. <coughs> Some colleagues believe you can only do that if the um, entity that is actually, or that did draft the convention is the same. So you could read uncitral texts in light of each other, but you could not read uncitral texts in light of unitral. That, to me, doesn't make any sense, because I agree with you. If, this, if the goal behind the text is the same and the interpretation rules are the same, then you should be able to. But again, let's not forget that the starting point has to be the CSG. So you can't read new stuff into the CSG. So I wouldn't say. Um, Unidrop principle, any other instruments complements, because that would mean, you know, maybe filling a gap. Is that no? You would interpret it. Just to give an example um, in relation to um, Uncitral, and we will be talking about later, I think, um, formation. Electronic contracting. The new convention, of course, is something that can help. Re, um, define what the CSG says. But the starting point is always the CSG rule. When does an offer reach the offeror? If the offer is made electronically, does the offer have to reach the server of the person or the mailbox? For that, we can use the new UNCITRAL convention even though it's not enforced. But why? Because it does not change the original rule on offer. It only defines for electronic purpose what reach means. So that, in my opinion, would be OK. Good faith, you mentioned. In my opinion, good faith is something that you use to interpret the CSG. That's what it says, Article 7, one last sentence. Some people may read other obligations into it, and I'm one of those, with it more limited than others. I do that. But only because the CSG has an overall arching principle. You can't create completely new um, obligations for the parties through the um, good faith principle. But my overall point, and you mentioned it very in, in the beginning, and you referred to it, my overall point is we need a uniform methodology. I do not care whether a German court says five days is too long for examination, and a Brazilian court will say, um, yes, five is OK. I could not care less. As long as the method is the same, let me give an example, Article 39. Article 38 is a little easier because the time is more limited. But Article 39 is the best example. There are two views out there. One is wrong and one is correct. The wrong one is that there are presumptions. There are presumptive periods of time. That, to me, is completely violating the history. It's just because one professor suggested it. Some, fortunately, not the majority, of course, have taken it over. The presumptive period is a problem because the presumptive period puts a new burden on the good guy. The good guy is the buyer who receives goods that do not conform, because that is required. So if the buyer has a month, about a month, that's what uh, the German Swiss courts say, about a month to give notice, and the buyer gives notice after five weeks, do you see that there is a burden on the buyer to actually show why five weeks is still OK? Because normally, the presumption is one month is OK. That is not what the CSG did. The bad guy, allegedly, is the seller. The good guy gives notice. It is up to the seller to say that it's unreasonable. See, so there is a mismatch. In fact, in my opinion, the better view is that you apply a case-by-case -case analysis, irrespective of any presumptions. Then that it may lead to some, that's something completely different, but the starting point is different. So you see, I do not care, even so there are, as you completely rightly point out, some very vague concepts, that so these vague concepts lead to contradictory case law. If the method is one and the same, believe me, in five years we will all know that you, know, um, you have uh, less time when, for example, the goods are perishable to give notice, obviously. Whether then it's three days or two, I do not care. So I completely agree with what you said. Um, but uh, I do not see that big of a problem unless you would use different methodology, like in this 39 case. I mean, we could at one point, even in 10 years, maybe we all say presumptions are good. But you have to pick one methodology, and that will get us close. There will always be, but that's true even in domestic law, some concepts that are vague, reasonable, um, 
as you said, there are 47 different times when it's actually referred to in any variation, as you mentioned. But I can live with that. I can live with that. As you do live, we all live with that in our domestic law. Which may be necessary. Yes, yes exactly. Absolutely, yes. Is to give to the interpret interpreter, the judge, yes. or the arbitrator the faculty of find what is the best solution for it, that okay. case Absolutely. in the light of circumstance. Yes. So that's why it's a case by case. Yes. And there is no really case law because in one case, 15 days is too much, another day, five days is not yes. enough. Well, then it's really case, but so they are in purpose variable. Yes. And so you said, okay, I'm fine with that as long as you use the same methodology. Yes. And then when just thinking about it, isn't it like a, a trying to find a second criterion, the same methodology, because there is no really methodology to interpret what is reasonable in one case. You are going to reason about it. You are going to find the reasons for that, but there is no methodology. It's what you think, what your subjective approach, what your con in the context of circumstance you think which is the best. So, of course, the, the word best doesn't come to any solution. It's the same open content. So there is no specific methodology for reasonable, as soon as practical. And good faith, we try. We try to establish the three perspectives of good faith, what is objective good faith. But this is also scholars studying and proposing uh, interpretation criterion, and still they are vague. <laughs> So in the end of the day, uh, there is no methodology for it. And they, we, we live, and that's your, that you're right, we live in the domestic law with the same problem. So the question is, is there a difference by dealing this, with this open concept in domestic law and, be, and the difference in dealing with this variable concepts in CSG? And there is a difference, I think. Because in domestic law, you have more jurisprudence, and you have more scholars, so you have m the possibility of having more consistency and the uh, application, interpretation, application of it, more chances. Because we know the practice, it doesn't work like that. Uh, in international field, you don't have, because the autonomous interpretation gives you this possibility of having anything that is not domestic inside of it which is why I said that autonomous interpretation by itself is not enough, absolutely, yeah. so I am not one of those who yeah. believes that. Yeah. But I think you already identified a methodology, because at least as far as reasonableness is concerned, whether you take a presumptive approach or case-by-case -case approach, there you have a distinction already. See that? So if we say case-by-case, -case, you have to look into it, it's one thing. If you say 15 days or 30 days is actually normally reasonable, you have a different approach. But is it enough to call this a methodology? I Just say saying it's case by case. Okay, this is the methodology. Case by case is different <laughs> from enough. presumption. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. Yes, a presumptive approach, yeah. whether you like it, let's say yeah. you are in favor, is different from a case by case. Because it puts really, shifts the burden of proof, for example, from the seller to the buyer to say, hey, oh, it's five weeks, so I still have. Yes, so I would say that's one. I wouldn't be able to identify one, of course, for um, good faith and so forth, which is why I agree with what you said, um, Rabbi, meaning autonomous means just not domestic. You are completely right. I still believe, and uh, I think uh, Pilar can um, also um, say that all the ones writing on Article 7 and autonomous, I mean, I think we know by now what it means, I, what autonomous interpretation means. Not what the result of its application to all the concepts is. So here you refer to, I quote, an ongoing effort. Yes. So maybe we know today what a place of business is. Yes. Maybe we don't know yet what validity under Article 4 is concerned, because it's out, but is that, A, an autonomous concept or a domestic concept? If it's an autonomous concept, what does the autonomous concept of validity entail? So that's why I agree. Still, the method is, in my opinion, the big thing. Whether we get to divergent results, ultimately, that's a different issue. It adds a new um, problem. If these different results can be identified as being different and consistent, then for the lawyer it's perfect, because you can predict that this is where predictability comes in. But if those differences are not consistent, then you can't play the game one, some of us want to play. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I suggest that we collect the, the questions and remarks that we have, then we get back to the table. Does anyone have a question? Any remark? Thank you. Um, I, I understand good faith in two things. Uh, principle, uh, create uh, second uh, duties, and uh, uh, standard. As a standard, is variable. It's a measure of behavior. And uh, reasonable, the same thing. It's a standard, not a principle. It's a standard, and it's variable. It's never the same. Never the same. Yes, that may well. I, I wonder because we know what good faith probably is at one point yeah. for certain kind yeah. of problems. You see, um, as, a, as a standard, but not as a principle. As you create new duties. I don't think it creates new duties. Uh, sometimes uh, the interpretation. Uh, Th that's already a big difference because we do believe here in Brazil yes. that good faith creates uh, duties. In Italy, uh, com well. yeah. to, complete, it's, it's, uh, to complete the, the obligation or the contract, uh, the party uh, did not inform something, and the judge says you must inform, mm -hmm. say, a uh, duty, uh, not principle. But it's very important to the, the contract. Yes, I agree. And there's a lot of uh, Supreme Court cases yeah. that say exactly what you even, <laughs> even citing me on the exactly yeah. that point. But my starting point is still something exists in the CSG. That's the only difference. So um, you have to find that duty somewhere in the CSG itself. Then you can use yeah. good faith to justify it. I agree. But it is in the CSG. Yeah, I understand yes. it. Article 7. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. If we have some more time, I would like to go back to this issue of uh, methodology. In, um, in your view, the use of foreign case law is by itself a methodology towards uniform application, yes. or uh, it is a means to try to reach a common methodology uh, for the uniform application. So just for, for I, me to have I believe clear. that you need, because there is a mandate in Article 7, to actually look at foreign case law. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. So I really believe you do that. That said, from a methodolog uh, methodological point of view, you cannot consider foreign case law binding. So that's something, again, that goes to the methodology. Um, so that's where I would stand. And you also need it to actually get to decide which of more than one autonomous interpretation will lead us to uniformity. Because if 10 different judges use 10 different concepts of autonomous interpretation, autonomous concept, that's perfectly nice and it works as far as Article 7, one very first part of that. Do you get uniformity? No. So you have to do other things. You have to find not the one that is statistically most often applied, but probably the one that is more convincing. But for you. So maybe after 10 years, you have nine different autonomous concepts of, of one concept. And maybe in another 10 years, it will be narrowed down. I believe really that if we know about case law, and if we take that into consideration, the good, the convincing, reasonings to be found in the court decisions will guide us to one at one, one, two. I mean, that's not a problem. So it's, it's like a program. Yes, yes. Is there a question here? Uh, yes, absolutely, more yes. And it's exactly what I said. It's a goal everywhere. Yes, it's a goal more than a, uh, yes. Sí, eh, en relación con, con los casos, eh, me gustaría eh, promocionar un instrumento que, en el que Franco además ha, ha participado desde el, desde el principio, que es el, el, el compendio de la UNCITRAL, el UNCITRAL Digest. Yo creo que es un instrumento eh, maravilloso porque eh, facilita muchísimo, nunca mejor dicho, la digestión de los casos eh, que hay en el mundo en relación con la aplicación de la Convención de Viena. Y mi pregunta es para, para el profesor Ferrari, ¿en qué medida eh, considera que el digesto, el compendio, debe ir más allá y tomar posición cuando hay 
elementos de, o posiciones eh, de conflicto en los casos. May I add one yes. point here? Um, I think that one of, uh, well, the most important uh, thing here is to think about, to envision how this will work in the Brazilian legal system. And taking into account the Uncetral Digest, that I think it's a great work, and for to push this transnational culture that you are supporting is important for the CISG application interpretation. Uh, how to uh, be, make possible, like, for the Brazilian community to feel part of this transnational community, especially taking into account that we speak Portuguese, we are a large country, and uh, that probably will have judges applying this convention in the very far away places. And they don't speak English, they don't never probably travel abroad. So how do you think that uh, it's possible for, to enforce this transnational perspective of this instrument in the Brazilian legal culture? So that's a problem, of course, that all cultures face, and a lot of colleagues do something about it. Um, Pilar has the nicest website with court decisions in Spanish, not only Spanish court decisions. So there are a lot of other websites. Now, of course, the Digest. The Digest, and I was actually the original promoter of the Digest when I was at the UN. I was the first editor of it. It just came out again. I like it. Thank you for saying nice things. But it's not what it was supposed to be because of what I will say now and uh, which uh, Pilar referred to. You will find on any given issue opposite views being expressed in case law and the digesters, I was one of those, we were not allowed to guide the reader to the one court decision that should be followed. I say that because when we proposed it, the first thing everybody opposed, because these were law professors sitting at UNCITRAL representing their own countries, that we were not allowed to refer to scholars. Why? Obviously, because they were afraid that UNCITRAL would forget their names. <laughs> I mean, yes, you are a scholar. You write the most amazing books, and UNCITRAL is not citing you. You don't want that. So all of the colleagues, I was there, I proposed it. All of the colleagues said, no. Everybody agreed on that. No, 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 no. OK, OK. So these are out. Except ever, so not one single law. What about the advisory council? That's really that advisory right. council, the UNCITRAL does not like, and I was there when it was created. Um, it's advisory council has 10 very good professors getting together, nothing else. Exactly. So, I mean, let's be true. So you are one of the, I mean, I'm one of the members, and I completely exactly. agree. Exactly. I mean, there is no pretension by us to do something, you know. Today. Yeah. It was <laughs> earlier. Exactly. <laughs> I will be on to say that. But let's go to the digest. So the digest is a great instrument. You will not have to read the 2,841 cases that exist. You read two pages or three, you get an idea of what's happening. The bad thing is that there is a missed opportunity. Uncitral is the one drafting the CSG. It could have guided and said, these are good or bad decisions. Then the countries came and said, you should not, as the UN, criticize our courts. I can live with that. Then I said, but let's at least praise the very good ones. There are some court decisions we all agree are excellent. We were not even allowed to praise the very good ones. So I think it's a very nice instrument, but it gives you a picture without comment of what is happening today. I was very much criticized because in my parts, of course, I made comments. Uh, if you read it, you read right away what opinion I have. It says, you know, then there's many court decisions correctly point out, and then at one point I say, of course, there are a few going the other way. So you really read. I was criticized a lot in legal writing for that, but now it's published, so I can't care less. Um, so it's a very nice point. I think one should have gone further. Uncitral missed an incredible opportunity. The, the advisory council is one of those law books, all of the books we are writing. I mean, um, but there is still a lot to be done. Unfortunately, Uncitral missed this incredible opportunity three times. 2004, 2008, and in 2012, because the new one is from this year. Okay, one more question. Uh, well, just, uh, just adding on the, on the comments about the, uh, about the difficulties that maybe the Brazilian courts will have in applying uh, uh, this. Can you state your name, please, because we're recording? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's uh, Mauro Penteado. So, uh, um, 
about the difficulties about uh, of the Brazilian courts to apply uh, uh, this 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 already uh, created uh, transnational body of decisions as to how to interpret the convention is that uh, uh, because Brazil is 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 adhering to this convention only now uh, many years after its uh, its publication uh, or, or its or, or, or its creation uh, what we have is a is a, a very complex body of uh, court decisions, uh, uh, you know, addressing specific points uh, uh, of the convention, specifically this, uh, uh, this vague or variable uh, terms such as good faith, uh, good faith, or what, what is material, what is uh, reasonable or not. Uh, I think that in some, uh, if, we, if we analyze all of these decisions, uh, at least in part of, uh, at least part of, of, of those decisions will start uh, based on a starting point which will be uh, uh, the local system, right? Just like uh, Professor Avera mentioned that in Brazil, for example, if we were to interpret the definition of good faith, we would probably use uh, 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 the understanding of our scholars about secondary duties, for example, in, 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 uh, uh, in terms of, of telling what is good faith. Uh, so, uh, uh, the question is, or, 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 or the comment is, I, 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 I think we might have some problems in convincing the, the, the Brazilian courts to use this, this, uh, this transnational body of, of decisions, because uh, the, uh, I'm afraid that the judges will simply say, look, uh, well, those are great, they have been applying this convention for over 30 years, uh, but they have been applying based on a starting point, and the starting point is uh, their uh, local law, their, do their domestic law, to interpret uh, good faith, uh, uh, reasonable, et uh, and so on. So, uh, this is, uh, 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 I think that uh, uh, that that may be a, a challenge that we will face when when applying the convention here in uh, in Brazil, and uh, uh, maybe other countries uh, have already suffered the same the same discussions, and I just want to, 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 to hear uh, what, what, what was the outcome. You are, of course, right, but consider that that's not the Brazilian problem, meaning it's a problem in all of the countries. Two things I want to mention. The Digest, in its new version by um, the University of Pittsburgh, will print it and will send it out, without exception, to all US federal members of courts. So from now on, actually, starting December, all of the US federal courts will have a copy of the digest. So see, that's one thing. Because consider that it entered into force there 25 years ago in the US. You have 165 court decisions? That is ridiculous. Do you really believe that there are only 165 problems that ever came out of international contracts since 1988 with foreign parties in the US? The answer has to be no. Do you see that? So that's why I'm saying. This is something one could do. They are getting this in order to make them more aware of. The other thing is, I do not believe it's just a Brazilian problem. It's a problem with all the courts. That is really what it's about. And even in countries where it has been enforced 20, since 1988 for 25 years. So um, I would not be as pessimistic. I also believe you can't do worse than in the US, so let's be honest. <laughs> so you should be happy. But that's why CSG goes along with uh, arbitration. Because these people are much more keen to apply yes. properly uh, CSG yeah. than the judges. You are, of course, right. I'm only saying the cases we know of are not cases that would go to arbitration. You see cases of the courts, um, we're talking about $25,000, $5,000. 100 is really a lot, even. Yeah. So um, I would agree the big players, and probably you are lawyers for the big players, should consider what was said correctly, obviously. I'm only saying, and this is, goes in, is in line with what I said yesterday, small and medium-sized enterprises do maybe not have that option. So we have to do it for them. Many times there are no contracts. We can contract. Exactly. So, so, so we come to a consent that you know the larger deals, they are going to have arbitration yes. clauses, yes. and we are going to discuss CSG under, with arbitration. And for small contracts, here in Brazil, it's very easy. They're going to apply consumer code. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's between done. companies. Now it's I Lex Fori. <laughs> between companies, not really. So it's not a question. We know what's going to happen. We have <laughs> predictability, <laughs> consistency. I that joke yesterday already. <laughs> okay, uh, just I, one last question, probably I just, another. I just want to uh, add one comment, which came to my mind uh, regarding Mauro's comment and, and uh, Michelle's comment. If we think of a much uh, more complicated problem, which is the uh, application of foreign law if you are in an environment of uh, private international law rules. Uh, you might think it's impossible for a, a court, a judge, lost in the backlands and the Amazon to apply uh, French law if he has to uh, apply a conflict of law rule that would end up in, in the application of a, a, a foreign law that he has never seen, he doesn't understand the language. So uh, I think if we're dealing with the CISG, uh, we are resolving an extensive part of the problem. And I don't think this uh, risk of having a judge that does not exactly understand the, the very precise concepts that other courts in other parts of the world have expressed about one particular article uh, that would in any way harm the, uh, the uh, proper application of the CISG. Yes, absolutely, yes. Okay, so thank you very much for such enlightening debate.